On this episode of Marketing Mavericks, we talk to Patrick Byrne, who's the CEO of Overstock.com, on their use of Bitcoin and their expansion overseas. We also talk about Pinterest, customer relationship management, and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, where we are meeting at the intersection of marketing and technology, where we talk about everything that's happening on the web and how businesses and brands are engaging customers, how as consumers we're buying and as, as marketers we're reaching out to customers. We're going to talk today with a few of our favorite marketing people and a one-on-one -on -one interview with the CEO of Overstock.com, Patrick Byrne. Welcome to the show. Great to be on, Tanya. Thank you. <laughs> we were talking uh, pre-show. You're all laid back and cool. Look at this. <laughs> Sorry. You want me to go put on a coat, suit and tie? I know. I, didn't, I thought you were in California. I, I figured you wouldn't object. I feel overdressed. Like, you know, I should be sitting back with like a, you know, a little spritzer or something, some some poolside drink. Um you're definitely a cool CEO. You, got, you shared some really interesting stuff personally too, and not a super big fan of social media. You actually, uh, you actually are a pretty private dude, right? Well, yes, I wouldn't say I'm not a big fan. I'm a huge fan of social media. I mean, I'm I I love what it does. I understand the theory. Followed it from the beginning. I just myself cannot take part in the early days of social media. I took part in LinkedIn. And I got overwhelmed with hundreds of invitations a day, and I just stopped. And then I uh, I mean, I see the power of Twitter and Facebook, but I literally I don't I don't go there. Uh, I don't want to be out in public, in even in in either in meat space or in cyberspace. So I, I mean, I I have somebody who twits for me. I tell him what I'd like him to put up <laughs> and things like that. But I, uh, uh, but I myself. So I sh I wouldn't say I'm not a fan. I just don't take partake myself. Well, and I I would say that kind of builds into your super cool uh, persona. Although I will say. Um, somebody that actually does tweet a lot, who's I think kind of a super cool um, potentially CMO or uh, CEO, is uh, uh, John Leisure at T-Mobile. So like, you guys have some similar kind of laid back style there. Yeah, well, right. I blog a lot. I have a blog called Deep Capture, where it's very political, and I blog a lot. But I, uh, so yes, I, I've heard of that fellow. I heard he's a cool dude. <laughs> I've heard of that fellow. We'll have to get you both at the brick house at the same time. I think that'd sure. be a fun chat. Okay, so let's talk about Overstock. You are, um, you're doing some really innovative things. You've had uh, a lot of expansion uh, this year, and I want to get into how you're expanding Overstock. But Overstock.com, um, one of the things that intrigued me most about what you're doing right now is you're actually accepting Bitcoin, which is a virtual um, a currency that's been all over the news and people are still really trying to figure that out. You guys have been doing that since January and you're the only major retailer um, uh, doing so, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan. I, I think of it as space cash. It's the first form of money <laughs> that can be beamed across the galaxy. Uh, I I love cryptocurrency. My I, I'm not I, I'm not uh, f beholden or I should say fetishistic or something about Bitcoin itself like some people are. It's any form of cryptocurrency. I think is a great it world historical innovation and I'm glad we finally got here. So how does that actually work? So people are still trying to, as consumers go, figure out how to use this virtual currency. It's confusing to a lot of people. And as far as a business, I think it's also very uh, intimidating, I think, for a lot of businesses to to try to use this. How does this work for you guys? I mean, are you cashing it in? Are you uh, promoting it somehow to your consumers? Well, it's it need not be intimidating. For on our side, we take it, we integrate it with Coinbase. Uh, and But any consumer can go to Coinbase, Coinbase, Coinapole, BitPay, a whole number of different companies, sign up for a wallet, takes you a minute, link it to your bank account. And then, I mean, it literally takes you a minute to get on the Bitcoin grid. Uh, for us, we accept Bitcoin and immediately 
translate it back into dollars, about 90% of it back into dollars. We are accumulating about 10% over time. Uh, but we are, uh, but so we don't really have any volatility risk, but it's great. It, it, there's a lot of reasons for us to do it, including that it saves you the two or 3% on transaction fees. Uh, but also there are philosophical reasons that I support Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency in general and want to see it's, it's, it's spread. Well, we'll expand on that. What are the philosophical reasons to, um, to support virtual currency and, um, its growth? Well, we uh, virtual currency, cryptocurrency is by its nature peer to peer. It bypasses, doesn't need centralized institutions. I believe that the centralized institutions in our society, uh, namely the central bank, the Federal Reserve, and the the central counterparty clearing, which underlies our capital market, which is called the DTCC, have both been captured by oligarchs, and they're being run to the detriment of society. And so what cryptocurrency lets you do is bypass them and check out of a system you don't trust anymore. And if, po if possible, the disruptive power of that of cryptocurrency can be brought to bear on those central institutions. Wow, that's a lot of mouthful right there. Uh, you know, OK, so let's talk about just Bitcoin in general and the fact that um, the economy is the way that it is. Do you think that Bitcoin is going to actually spike the economy? Or are we going to see um, a surge in purchases because now people have, a, you know, pockets full of virtual currency? No, not at all. What, what cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin is there for is when the current economy collapses, you have a robust parallel alternative that you can quickly switch to. The parallel purchasing power. How has it affected uh, Overstock then? So are you seeing any additional uh, purchases or are people just instead of using traditional currency, are they just switching to Bitcoin? Or are you seeing new customers come to Overstock? Oh, we're seeing a lot of new customers. We've probably had 10,000-ish so new customers come because of our acceptance of Bitcoin and who want to show their support. We will be getting it live for international customers relatively soon over the next few months or in the next few months, um, let's say September. And when that comes live, I expect it will really enhance our global business. What percent of purchases um, did you see? I think day one, I think you had, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the figure, just immediately within the first 24 hours, you saw um, people flood to overstock and buy their sofas or, or rugs or whatever it was with Bitcoin. What are you seeing as far as a trend over the last, over the first quarter? Well, that first, that first day was huge. All these people around the country came and that made it sort of 5%. 10% or 5% of our sales that day. But in general, it's still less than half a percent. It's really less than, it's say on a typical day, 0.2% or 0.15%, you know, of 15 basis points of our sales. So it's still relatively small compared to the overall sales, except it is growing at a, I mean, we don't, uh, it is growing at, at quite a brisk pace, 15 to 20% per month. So, uh, so I would expect in a year it will not be such a de minimis part of our sale. Well, it might start being 1% of our sales. And then before you know it, it'll be 5 8%, something like that. Well, and, and it's interesting because I don't think that the average uh, person who um, is familiar with maybe like an Amazon who has a very popular, um, you know, consumer profile, if you will. Um, Overstock, you guys have always been really innovative and leaders. And I think just uh, this, this idea of virtual currency is just a part of that. And, you know, you mentioned that these are national sales, but you guys are actually expanding overseas as well. Um, and that's a big move for you this year. Um, talk a little bit about that. Great. Thanks. Yeah, well, we are, we think of ourselves as the little engine that could. We started off, no venture capitalists behind us, no venture capitalists ever invested, went public in a Dutch auction, just partially as a way of, of, of sticking a finger in the eye of Wall Street. So we've been iconoclastic uh, from the beginning and, see, and taking on the big boys. Now, we've never really developed much of an international business, frankly. It's about like 1% to 2% of our sales. And no, it's about 2%, yeah, 2%. Uh, and that's a shame because we were focused on getting everything working here in the U.S. domestically, and we we did. We're quite profitable. We have nice operating margins. We're lots of cash. We're we're in good shape. Uh, so what we 
most most internet companies when they go international they roughly double if you look back to when ebay started going international or amazon they double in the space of say three years they, they develop just as big an international business as domestic uh so we're hoping our domestic business this year should be on the order of a billion five so we're hoping that we can develop uh a billion to a billion five dollar business as we build out our international platform. Uh, what what we've been working on is a unique way of doing that, of hooking up with suppliers internationally. And it's taken us a couple of years to build the platform, but it went live in May. And we're starting, we'll be over the course of the rest of this year, bringing, bringing live more international suppliers. And it'll take probably two or three years to fill out a, a network around the globe. So where are you targeting? Um, what what countries or what part of the globe is is uh, is in your radar? Canada's first, and then next is East Asia, and probably something in North Europe. And how are you building the strategy? I mean, what made you decide this is where? Like, why do we want to be in? I mean, Canada, I think makes sense just uh, operationally. I mean, I think it would be much easier to do that. But you know, you talked about. I, I've heard you say that you've been, you know, scoping out warehouses across the globe. Where, how did you decide this is the area we want to have our warehouse and this is how we're going to market this overseas strategy? So talk about the location and how what the process was like to figure out where to expand. Well, part of it is market analysis, which is both finding places that, you know, have income and are wired. Uh, however, that's less. And then on the other hand, it's looking at, where are where how thick is the competition on the ground and so it's a combination of trying to find trying to find good markets but haven't been picked over by other people now canada is obviously well developed and china has a robust market but we figured we'd start off in in two places where uh we are where we're confident we can get the systems integrated and working well and there's good sort of first world uh technology and logistics and china is getting there by the way china is really is <laughs> i used to live in china many many years ago and it was a, it was the logistics were not first rate then uh but then after those two countries we're looking at countries which aren't the immediate uh, uh immediately obvious follow-on countries but they're places where people are wired there's not great uh online shopping uh, already but that there's an opportunity to get in there and, and sort of be one of the early movers rather than uh, just swimming in after Amazon and, and eBay and stuff like that. Well, and, and, you know, again, speaking of Amazon, the fact that you guys were, uh, you know, at the forefront of using this virtual currency, I think it's really innovative. You've done other things in the past. But I want to step back to the core of your business, which is looking at the people actually producing the products, right? So the, the pe person that makes the sofa and you've done everything from working, I think, at a large scale to even you've got a boutique part of your business, which I was really interested in. And you, you find these, you know, um, small boutique uh, you know, people who make products and you actually include that in the overstock um, portfolio. How much a part is the boutique part of your business? Like, what does that make up of all the products that you sell? Well, if you're talking about world stock, which is our artisan production, we have about 10,000 artisans around the world who produce for us. We, uh, that's probably about two and a half percent of our business now. Uh, we also have Main Street America, which is, or the Main Street Revolution, we call it, I'm sorry. It's a, another store within Overstock where we're carrying the products of small entrepreneurs, typically with less than 20, I think they have to have less than 20 or 25 employees small within the United States. And those those are great. There are some real success stories in there too, where people, somebody has a little candy shop and they, they put their stuff online through us and they start selling hundreds of thousands of dollars through us. So those are the two, the world stock, which is for the international artisans and then main street is, is domestic. And I, I love that you, um, you include these smaller businesses. And I don't think when people think of overstock, I don't think they think of, um, you know, I'm buying local kind of feel that you offer like an Etsy or something like that, where you really support small business, but you do, and you make it really easy for them to be engaged. It's kind of, the future eBay, if you will, or, you know, um, you guys are staying at the front. I mean, you know, virtual currency, you're looking at small retailers. How does that work though, from the standpoint of marketing? Like how do you market that part of the business? Do you separately market it or, and promote it? Because I think a lot of people don't realize you offer that. 
You know, it is a problem only that I, I know that a lot of people don't know we offer those kinds of goods. Uh, our diehard, our, our regular customers know because they come and they're shopping around and we can measure how much they're shopping outside of the channel that they started with. So suppose they came and bought a desk the first time. Are they just coming to buy additional furniture or when, you know, when do they stop? start shopping in other categories. Well, that's increasing. So they are they are finding their way to things like World Stock and, and Main Street Revolution. Uh, we don't market it separately. Well, traditionally, we haven't marketed it separately because it's just so expensive to build a brand at this point that we don't we didn't want to ha- develop them as a separate uh, as a, as separate brands. However, what is happening is myself and my colleague Stormy Simon, who is the president of Overstock and really is the person with whom I built this company, or maybe she would probably say she built the company with a little assist from me. Uh, she, we're starting to do commercials together. I think there's one running now where we talk about our new pets tab. And we're going down to film some more commercials. And so we're, we are starting to promote those, not just Overstock as a whole, but the individual tabs. Uh, we're filming one on World Stock as well that you'll see playing probably later this summer. So I know that you personally, um, besides your blog, aren't big into social media, but social media is a part of every marketing strategy today. And you guys have been so focused on customer service. In fact, it was even mentioned in our chat room that um, you know, you, you actually have a call center. You actually talk to people unlike oh, yeah. your competitors like eBay or Amazon. You actually really understand the customer service experience. So how far, how much of a part is social media play into that? Uh, well, social media, we have been – so don't, don't confuse my uh, – the fact that I myself <laughs> don't like to take part in social media with a corporate position because we've been very early in the game on social media. We have a really ro- uh, good social media team. We started at first using social media to monitor what people thought about us. And if there were any problems out there, we I think we were one of the very – well, the only company I heard doing this before we did it, what I, it was, what is it called? The Geek Squad. Do you know that company? I do. I do. I know uh, know them quite well. I've actually uh, talked to them and Best Buy. Oh, really? Well, we had, I got the idea from them many years ago that we we started monitoring, monitoring social media. And if anyone said something in social media, like, oh, I just had, you know, I got something from Overstock, plugged it in, didn't work, or they had some kind of problem. We had people, we had customer service reps who were constantly monitoring social media 24-7 and would engage with them and say, how do we fix your problem and such. So if anyone was griping at all in social media they got con- about us, they got contacted and we set things right. So it was just another way another way to find customers and make them, make them happy. And we think that probably, you know, it's hard to measure, but that probably paid, paid off pretty big in terms of people could see in social media that to the extent those conversations were public, people could see, oh, you know, that Overstock really takes this seriously. You know, okay, so let's look at uh, Best Buy for a second. And I'll have to tell Robert Stevens, who I've interviewed before, um, that you, uh, you you mentioned him. He'll be thrilled, I'm sure. He's a big fan of Twitter, though. He tweets a lot. Um, I know. <laughs> so let's talk about Best Buy. As a CEO of a company where you're not afraid to take chances, you you know, you know, I, again, virtual currency, something everybody's afraid of, but you're doing it. And, um, and I, th- I think that you wouldn't be the typical retailer that somebody would think of. You would think of an Amazon or somebody like that actually, uh, being the, the, the forefront, but you are. So as a CEO, um, what do you think like a, a company like Best Buy, who we've seen really go through, um, a downward spiral, I think, and not really embrace, um, some of the things that I think could have been a huge opportunity for them. I think it was only last year that they even price match. So what would you do differently if you were the CEO of Best Buy? Well, uh, first, the, the question to ask is always, if a company didn't exist, would you have to invent it? Well, if Best Buy did not exist at this point, truth is, if J.C. Penney did not exist at this point, would there be a need to invent them? Uh, you know, if Amazon didn't exist or at this point or Walmart or something, you would somebody would need to invent them. But I'm not sure. Uh, Best Buy, I think, could have they they probably should have focused more on their online strategy. I think that the uh, uh, and just early shifted. Uh, uh, well, I, I I don't know their game well enough, but I I do think that they were a, 
uh, not as not as capable in online as they should have been. And that was, you know, business people always love to complain about commodity. My, my markets, my industry's gotten commodified. My industry's gotten commodified. Like that's awful. Well, first you got to remember somebody figured out how to decommodify water. You know, Perrier is is water, and yet they decommodified water. They've done it with all kinds of brands of water. So if you can decommodify water, you can decommodify anything. But in addition, it's the the internet is the uh, even if it is a commodity market, the, you can if you're the low cost operator, you can clean up in a commodity market if you can keep your costs down. So if if you've got a five or ten percent cost advantage on everybody else, well, the way to do that is is I think that with computers and electronics and such, it's, uh, I wouldn't want to own a store. I don't see the advantage anymore of owning a store that's so commodified. People can do all their research online. In fact, the last time I was in a retail store years ago was Best Buy. I'm going to retail stores. And I remember, I, sh- I shouldn't slag any individual's business, but let me just, com- the, the, it struck me the difference between the consumer experience, shopping online, how much information you could, if you want to buy a new DVD player, you can take 10 minutes, become an expert in DVD players, get all this comparison shopping done, get all this information, make an informed decision. Try going into a meat space store and doing the same thing. And for for any sort of technical product, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I guess my advice would have been to focus much more on their internet strategy. I think that there was a there were some very large retailers who played the game smart and decided, like Walmart and Target, who didn't, who didn't rush into the internet. They hung back, and they waited to see what worked, and then they got serious starting around 04, 05 about the internet, and they, they developed brick-and-click strategies, and they worked very well. But the companies that waited longer than that, uh, uh, And I think that Walmart and Target only got away with waiting as long as they did because they were already Walmart and Target. The companies that waited longer than that to get their uh, internet strategy together really suffered. And I think Best Buy is a good example. So let's talk about the brick brick and mortar versus the online strategy. I mean, you're solely online. So, you know, if I want to, you know... so I've made no secret that I've been looking for a sofa for, for a while now. And uh, I've saved several in my shopping cart at Overstock, uh, including uh, from one of the, the uh, boutique businesses that you, um, that you represent. So I guess, you know, my question is, I want to sit on the sofa. I want to feel it. I want to find out how comfortable it is. And last week we had on uh, Katrina Lake, who is the CEO and founder of a company called Stitch Fitch. I did I do it again stitch fix which is uh which basically sends out uh clothing to women to try on and buy and it's all virtual so but I might want to you know try on the clothes I might want to feel it how does that work for overstock I mean how how do you overcome the 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 touching the feeling and the connection that we get from a brick and mortar store to purchasing things online has that ever been an obstacle for you well, it is an obstacle, and it's especially an obstacle with apparel, but also furniture. People react the same way. You don't react that way with a book, you know. So it's hard to have a bad customer experience when you're shipping people books. As long as you get them the book or the CD or the DVD, you know they don't sit there and say, "Oh, it's not quite the color I thought it'd be." So it is hard. It's especially hard with apparel because of the fit issues. Uh, a few ways we can uh, we address that is first, shipping to you is free. And uh, we also take returns, and we have a generous return policy. In addition, though, we do a lot of statistical analysis of of products uh, after they've been purchased and how are consumers feeling about them. So if we have a sofa that is going out and the the typical complaint rate in that department is x percent but that sofa is generating 2x percent or 3x percent then we analyze it we know that okay there are uh you know we find out oh it's arriving damage well the shipping container must not be correct or it's the color people thought they're buying a a sofa of one color of blue and it's coming in lighter blue than they thought well we better change the description or we get the information back to the manufacturer in fact we have a very tight feedback loop so we can both find products that are uh 
generating customer dissatisfaction and either fix whatever the problem is or weed them out of our site. So we do that continuously. So you can be confident that when you're that in what that leads to is the quality of our goods has has got you know upped and upped and upped over the years as we've weeded out these losers and the discards and the ones that people didn't feel good after they bought them and we kept the others and looked for more like them so in general when you're buying a sofa from us or anything from us it's something that you know in general hundreds and hundreds of people have bought it before and we've been really analyzing their feedback and we're only keeping it if generally people are happy with it so as a CEO, and we, we get your cool factor is pretty high because, you know, we oh. talked about that. <laughs> and your, your anonymous yeah, social presence, right? But, okay, I, I don't know. I'm if not you, aware that I have a cool factor. I got to tell you, I, I, I haven't, I haven't, did, wasn't aware of that, but I appreciate it. It's pretty high. <laughs> so, okay, so let's talk about uh, being a CEO. Um, we, we're seeing much, much younger CEOs as um, you know, startups and technology, especially in the social space. And I don't know if you've kept up with the controversy for um, the CEO and founder of Snapchat, but um, he, you know, he's in the, you know, as many CEOs potentially can be, but he's in the spotlight for some things that he said when he was in a fraternity. And, and now people are looking at him and saying, gosh, you know, you know, this guy is really immature. He doesn't like women, et cetera, et cetera. How important is it, I mean, to maintain um, credibility with consumers? Because now I think, you know, I, I do, do people that use Snapchat really care about that? I don't know. Um, is it an age thing? Is it, is it that because we're seeing younger CMOs? I mean, I don't think, or CEOs, I mean, I don't think that's the issue because you have somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, who, although did have fun in college, never really said the same things as the Snapchat CMO or CEO. How important is your online reputation and the types of things that you say to people as far as its effect on your company? Well, I'm, I uh, may be the wrong guy to ask. I have a, uh, I'm extremely controversial in some circles, in financial circles and Wall Street circles. In fact, I'm quite proud that in January 2007, I was told very directly I was the most hated man on Wall Street. And, you know, they can carve on my tombstone that in January 2000, but I really was. And I'm, a, I'm extremely controversial in financial circles. Uh, I don't, I, my answer when people, you know, I've said a lot of controversial things. Uh, and and talk about oligarchy and and political questions. I'm the leader of these of the Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice, which is the the intellectual center of the school choice movement. I vouchers. So, for example, if you go on the NEA website, National Education Association, the teachers union, in other words, on their website they have a list of their public enemies. And you know how much the unions hate Walmart, for example, right? Everybody, all the unions hate Walmart. Well, Walmart's number two on their list. Number one on their list is me. I'm the most hated man. I'm the number one public enemy of the teachers union in the United States. Walmart's number two to me. So I'm a, so just to give you an example of two of the areas in which I'm controversial, hasn't affected me much. And when people gripe to me about it, I say, like, I shouldn't, I say, you know, I never signed away my First Amendment rights. Uh, so I am I have no problem being political, talking politics. I'm a pro-freedom guy. I'm a libertarian, small L libertarian, uh, small R Republican, small L libertarian. So I, uh, so I, you, you don't want, uh, uh, on the other hand, if somebody's, if somebody's out there saying juvenile frat boy kind of things, which it sounds like the Snapchat guy was saying, I, I don't know the the details, but from your description, it sounds like he said some frat boy kind of things. It was it was it was, it was some really uh, distasteful stuff. And and but I would here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that the the kind of reputation that you have, and we talked about uh, John Ledger. I think uh, you know from the standpoint of T-Mobile, I think that's actually helpful to the brand. I think the fact that you are not afraid to take chances comes across in your business strategy for Overstock. I mean, look at what you're doing. You're you're taking chances on virtual currency. I can't think of anything that potentially scares more businesses today than this idea that they don't even understand the currency itself, how to get it. Most people don't even know the average person doesn't even understand it at all. And And you're not only understanding it, but you're capitalizing and being one of the first. So I think your point of view, and even though it's controversial and different, actually helps your brand. That's totally different, I think, than, you know, 
I think your personality saying something disparaging about women or about, you know, p partying and that sort of thing, I think that has a different impact. And we've seen it even at HP when Mark Hurd, uh, you know, who's not a young guy exactly in the, in the same, same sense that uh, Snapchat CEO is. He's not 25, that is. And he mm. had a controversy. And I remember having some conversations with their head of marketing at the time and talking about the fact that as when you're trying to market a business, when you're trying to expand and like you are, you're huge. I mean, moving into overseas markets, this is a very big step for Overstock. I think your daredevil approach and, and, and potentially controversial on Wall Street, but it's, but it's helpful to your brand. I mean, don't you think? I like I like to think so, and it, whenever it's been brought up to me by, say, the board of directors, I point out that there's you know there's pluses and minuses, and we're probably winning, you know, some believers probably a lot more since the financial crisis than before. Uh, I think so. We had to we had to do things differently. We didn't have the vast capital that guys like Amazon and eBay had access to, and we didn't have any supporters on Wall Street. So we've had to do things. Uh, differently, although it isn't, I mean, I adopt these positions because I believe in them, not because it's a PR strategy. Uh, I guess in the case of some of the younger CEOs, I, I'm watching the show Silicon Valley. You ever heard of this HBO show, Silicon Valley? I have, I have. I think Leo is a big fan of it. It's really, I've just, I've just watched the first, the first, well, however many there are. And uh, I can see young CEOs getting and, and startup folks getting intoxicated with their own power. They're 25, they built something, an 18-man company that's worth a billion dollars or something, and they just become intoxicated with themselves and they think that none of the rules apply to them. And that might be part of what's going on. I would be hesitant to invest with someone like that. In fact, my experience is people like that burn out a lot. They, they rarely are successful over the long, over the long term. Uh, so that might be reasons to be, you know, you don't want to gratuitously insult or offend people. And it sounds, uh, it's hard for me to imagine a business like that. Certainly if you're sort of in the public market and you're trying to appear, uh, appeal to a mass consumer audience, you probably do want to think about who you're, who you're insulting uh, or, or offending. On the other hand, I may be, I live in Utah, but I supported the, uh, and I love Utah, but I supported the, I funded the lawsuit that overturned the anti-gay marriage constitutional amendment for the Utah uh, uh, constitution. And that didn't win me a lot of friends here in Utah. There are a lot of people who were really ticked about that. And so, uh, so I'm, I might be the last guy in the world <laughs> to ask that particular question to, because I'm a CEO who's offended a lot of people. But I think that uh, when young when young startups and CEOs of 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 startups are doing that, they're probably just showing immaturity rather than sort of any sort of strategy or, or maybe even a real co a commitment to the First Amendment. They're just sort of still haven't grown out of the frat boy phase. You know, a lot of in the tech world, there are a lot of pretty immature a lot, a lot of folks who haven't really you know, hone, don't have well-honed social skills. I'll put it that way. We, uh, you know what the definition of a, of an extroverted software developer is, right? No. One who looks at the other person's shoes as he's speaking. Oh. <laughs> as opposed to his own <laughs> shoes, right? Well, you know? you know, somebody in the chat room, Color Bandit, actually pointed out that what you're saying is leadership. You are leading overstock into areas that some are, make common sense. You you actually take phone calls and answer customer questions. You reach out to small businesses and and not just, you know, offer, you know, the big, you know, production uh, value of, of a large retailer, but you also offer, you know, the boutique experience. And we prefer the boutique. <laughs> yeah. And you're and you're experimenting in virtual currency, which you're obviously a huge fan of. And I think we're gonna see more of that. Expanding overseas. What 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 else, what do you hope to gain from expanding overseas? Like most businesses, when they when they jump into an overseas venture, they what double? I think probably their the size of their business, which is a huge growth. I mean, what are your what are your anticipation? Uh, you know, what what do you anticipate happening for for Overstock? Well, it's at this point we're you know we cover all our expenses with a little bit left over one one point two percent something like that. I'd like to see it get to two or three percent. That, as we expand internationally, it shouldn't take nearly the capital uh, and the expense structure underlying the overseas sales that we had to build here. Basically, we structured the whole company so that we would be profitable when we reached a billion dollars. And then we got to a billion dollars and we got 
profitable. So, you know, now we're a billion five. Uh, we'll, but as we, if we add a billion dollars in business overseas, it'll have a, it add much more to our bottom line than one and a half percent. I think it'll be significantly more profitable because we've already got all our expenses covered. And uh, there'll be a lot smaller incremental expense. Uh, also, we think we can build a global brand. You know, we build internationally. Our brand is O.co, not Overstock.com, and that's a bit of a problem to sort of go to the world with two. We have Overstock is domestic and O.co international, uh, but I think that we can turn that into a global brand over time. I'm so excited! I can't wait to have you out here at the Brick House, like we talked about, or or just you know, I'll, I'll you know, I'll be happy to come out and ride horses at the at the cabin, even though there is probably no Wi-Fi, right? There's no internet connection. <laughs> I wish. Some days I wish, but no, people have to reach me. Yeah, well, okay, so we've got a couple of other people that are going to be joining us. We want you to stick around, um, but we're also going to be joined now to kind of dig, dig into this kind of marketing uh, discussion with Chris Bacchus, who is the Executive Director of Digital at Golan & Harris. Welcome, Chris. Hey, good morning, Tanya. Good morning. Uh, we've also got John Ferreira. John Ferreira is the CEO and founder of Nimble. He's also the pioneer of CRM. Welcome, John. Thank you, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, with you and your audience and and your guests. I I was fascinated listening to Peter talking about how he uh, he he really is leading with his vision and what he's doing at Overstock. And I was particularly interested in what he's talking about Bitcoin and uh, and the Federal Reserve and uh, and some of the other esoteric things that I'm sure a lot of your audience didn't quite get. But uh, uh, having read quite a bit about that area, I was listening the other day about how they're saying that you could actually replace the banks of what they're doing as a middleman for money. And actually, they could just hold our money and we pay them to hold our money and protect it or just you know, they wouldn't lend it out. And that basically peer to peer lending is starting to happen. And it's a small part of the economy today, but that that actually can grow and uh, and change the way we do banking. But I'm sure that that. Um, that would t take a lot of time to happen. What do you think, Peter? Uh, you mean uh, well, Patrick? That, Patrick. Yeah, that's, that's okay, John. Uh, well, I, uh, I actually, uh, that is actually how banking worked, you know, until we went to fractional reserve banking, which was only legalized in 1844. But until then, the supposition with banks that was that when you deposited money, they were, they were not lending it out multiple times over. So I think that it's a chance to get back to that. And I think that it would be all, all for the good. Money as an institution loses its, uh, well, don't want to go into the economic theory, but it's, uh, <laughs> that's another show. We'll have to launch another There's show. The libertarian company yeah. out. <laughs> I, I, I actually yeah. do think this would be an interesting show because I've, Pete, there's a lot to what he's saying, Patrick's saying. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's a very, very fascinating. In fact, I almost forgot you guys were on hold because I was so sucked into this. Uh, just, you know, uh, you know, as, as again, the chat room pointed out, the leadership and the way that you think about the currency. And that's, we'll, we'll have to have everybody back to talk about that. So let's talk a bit about, um, you know, the customer experience and how we measure that. I mean, you talked a bit, um, Patrick, about how you measure that at Overstock and how important that is. And you have services like Yelp and just really understanding your customer and the customer preferences. Um, how how important do you think, uh, John, since you founded a CRM and, and pioneered CRM, how important is that to a company like Overstock or Amazon or eBay? I believe that the uh, the promises that you make to your customer and and how you deliver the experiences you that they get through interacting with your company and your brand and your products and your services ultimately is what builds your brand. And that if you aren't on a daily basis understanding the journey of your customer and uh, and what they are liking and disliking and how to improve that daily, you're in trouble. And a big part of that experience is the people that interact with your customers on a daily basis. And I think that that's what they built CRMs for uh, is to help with that customer experience and that interaction. The problem I think with CRM is that it really is a um, – thought of as mainly for salespeople, but it's not just salespeople that sell. There's multiple people in your company that are part of that customer journey. And especially with social today, the places of interactions have exploded and that uh, you now need to be able to walk in your customer's footsteps and participate with them in conversations. And that's one of the things that we're doing with <coughs> Nimble is powering companies so that everybody in the company can start participating in that customer journey to deliver excellent customer experience. 
Okay, um, Chris, you've been awfully quiet, you know, partly because we're just all talking about, you know, uh, everything that, that's going on in the space. You, you, you know, had some articles you and I were talking about yesterday that you thought were really important and, and marketing right now. Since you've been listening to Patrick and talking about Overstock and how they approach customer service on the agency side of the business, how do you, um, how do you treat clients like Overstock as far as understanding their customer, you know, customer base and how they, they work with customers? Well, I think John brought up a lot of great points. I mean, one of the big key pieces is there's very few businesses where there's no competitors. And so you really, why be less in the customer respect and customer reputation piece of your business? Because I could go ahead and just simply switch over to another retailer. I mean, there's a lot of people who, help, who sell couches online, for example. But if I have a relationship with the business that I know I could trust, that I know kind of respects, you know, maybe I got the color that um, I wasn't expecting, as we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, this is a way that really adds to the whole essence of what I'm doing as a customer with that particular business um, is, yeah, price is one piece, but customer service is what people keep coming back to. That whole idea of respect, um, relationship building, uh, the desire to want to come back to them again. So when you actually have to make a purchase, um, you know that you're going to have this very positive experience that it's going to be fairly hassle-free. And especially with online where we lose a lot of the whole touching and feeling and seeing what's there and, and seeing that color um, in, in the moment, you really want to have the total experience that's a very positive one, um, even when you're dealing with something like a return or something unsatisfactory. So all those elements together really add to the whole transaction and honestly, the whole repeat business factor of what's going to happen with any kind of company. So it's just so vastly important, as I'm sure um, both Patrick and John agree. You know, yes. uh, Yeah, I wanted to jump on that. <laughs> just uh, on just the point about CRM. If you're not doing real CRM, I mean, I'm never satisfied with our CRM, but when if you're not doing CRM as even a small company, you're just missing the boat. CRM is efficient marketing. When I think of the old way, and I've run companies before there was the internet, and everything was about broadcasting, broadcasting a message rather than narrow casting and building relationships. It's all about if it, there's, if you're not doing CRM, the highest payback you can possibly spend on your next marketing dollar is to get into C, to start doing CRM. And, and, and Patrick, I think on, on that whole idea of narrow casting is that uh, in order to narrow cast, you have to understand who your customer is. And right. so when you think about CRM today, it's a database that you have to type in what you know and, and what you did and what you think you should do with that customer. And I believe that what your CRM should do is automatically build a record on who that customer is across all their profiles, automatically log the journey and the experiences that have occurred, and then mine the data to help you identify uh, which customers to engage with and what messages and communication things that you should be sharing with them. And that's basically what I think of as an intelligent relationship manager. So that's where I think we're going with CRM is rather than the old days of just having to force people to type in uh, all their information about what they're doing and what they did and what they know about somebody for something to actually do it magically. And that's what we're trying to do at Nimble. But I also love the whole idea about broadcasting. I think that there was a day before Mad Men marketing mentality where we use interrupt marketing messaging to stop our customers so that our salespeople can bag them and tag them. Uh, that whole mentality of sales and marketing, I think, is going out the door with social because uh, today customers are ignoring your marketing material. They're not talking to your salespeople. They're having conversations amongst themselves about what they're going to buy. And then they're making decisions and then connecting with your company on whatever channel they want to, whatever department they want. And most companies' idea of dealing with that is putting some 25-year-old kid in front of the company with Hootsuite to react to people yelling at them, or worse yet, to use social to yell at the customer about how great they are. And I think that the whole world is shifting to begin uh, being a trusted advisor, enchanting and educating the customer, and then walking in their journey and participating in an authentic and relevant way. Ryan Holmes' ears are probably burning right now. Who's the founder and uh, CEO of Hootsuite? Um, he's really like, hey, you're talking about me. I do love Hootsuite, by the way. Okay, I so, use Hootsuite. Do you? Yeah. Are, you know, you probably have no idea what that is, Patrick. That is that's so outside of the whole realm of of how you use social. But I'm sure your social media person does. So let's just talk about CRM for a second. We've been kind of going on this roll, and the chat room brought this up, and just so that. 
our, our listeners, reviewers understand that this is a customer relationship management system. So it's something that basically technology or software that helps you uh, collect all this information. It used to be the business card, right, that you handed out at a networking event. And now it's really understanding your customer and treating their needs. And Patrick, we're talking about you guys expanding at Overstock and, and moving into other countries. Do you feel like you're understanding the customers you have now? I mean, do you feel like as a, as a consumer of, of Overstock, if I go in and buy a sofa, are you really understanding my preferences? And how are you capitalizing on your current customer base? Well, great question. Do I think we're doing it well enough now? Not. I think we're about 50% of the way there. And as a matter of fact, we're, we're looking for a CRM expert. So if anyone out there watching this <laughs> wants to send a resume to Patrick at Overstock.com, we'll take for looking to hire a director of CRM. Uh, I used to, 20 years ago, just to compare, to, to get more directly to your question, Tanya, 20 years ago, I ran a company that was marketing, telemarketing in, into, into factories around around the United States, Canada, and ultimately the world. And then CRM was a, uh, you know, you made the phone call, you, you, it was a log, you had this communication, this is the guy's name, this is the foreman's name, this is wife's name, she makes, you know, she bakes, here's some recipes that I'm going to send her, kid plays baseball, you just, it was like having just, it was more about capturing, enhancing your memory than it was real analytics. But with the internet, so much of the data is no longer that kind of data. It's the data on what people are clicking on, what they're purchasing, what the root of their clicking is, what type of device they're coming in on at different parts of the day, and understanding these patterns and finding and then mining, which is finding you know, when you have thousands or millions of people doing that, you can find patterns in the data. Now, patterns are much deeper than any you're going to see just with your eye, but you have to have big, you know, you have to have data mining, but you can find these patterns and then start honing your message. And, you know, to John's point, you can start honing it across. Was that you, John, or Chris? I'm sorry. John. I, John, okay. John. Start um, honing your message across different devices that people use. They're starting to be very well-developed patterns of different patterns between how people interact, say, through a... Uh, through a cell phone versus a tablet versus a desktop. And you can find those patterns and and adapt your message and your offering uh, <laughs> to, to to surf, you know, to take advantage of those differences. So it's a really good observation that we are using our devices differently. I mean, I actually am a big fan of Pinterest, right, which I think would be a really important social network for Overstock because I'm pinning. It is. We, we have a lot of connection with Pinterest. Really? Well, and, and Pinterest uh, has basically reached out to, in fact, there was an article that Chris brought to my attention, Pinterest Boost Analytics for Business by opening its platform to third-party marketers. Um, so, Chris, talk about uh, for a second about how important that is. Yeah, so I, I'm sure Patrick is seeing this a lot too. Um, you know, Pinterest works two ways. The one, the the one way it works is, of course, like you showed the uh, screenshot of the Overstock board is a company board, a co company presence for the company to go ahead and post stuff out there that hopefully go ahead and resonates with people following it. Um, you know, getting an idea of maybe different items that are have have a kind of a similar relationship. Maybe I'm looking up for outdoor furniture or baby products, whatever. I may find it a little bit easier or or more in a pattern that I like within the Pinterest experience than sometimes the website. The other way it's happening, of course, is people going to your website and pinning content out there. So what brands have had a trouble doing in some cases is understanding what's, how things are resonating, um, what behaviors are, are happening there, what kind of data we have from the user base that's there. So what's great is Pinterest is, of course, realizing the value that they're providing uh, corporations um, and, um, in a way to go ahead and, and further expand more usage of the platform and adoption of the platform so that companies could use it more in their marketing materials um, and also use it to obviously create more traffic for Pinterest itself too as it drives more to websites. So um, this is a great opportunity to go ahead and see some of those behaviors, see some of those, see some of that data. Third party marketers, of course, um, add some different layers of uh, you know, different visualizations and, and maybe even marrying some additional data within that. And, and we could see some more of what those behaviors are. And hopefully we could see it by platform and things like that as we see what um, the API, what the uh, application interface really provides when they go ahead and expand what they're offering for businesses um, that Pinterest is really moving towards. So we're going to learn what some of those capabilities are. We've seen a lot of this growth with uh, platforms like Facebook, which has evolved over and over time again all the time of what their analytics and insights are. So uh, Pinterest is 
is just really kind of starting that in, in its own adoption. And it's going to be a very positive thing as we really kind of do a lot more in the one-to-one marketing and stuff that we've been talking about here um, that really kind of adopts that whole idea of understanding your user base and understanding the audience you've built on platforms like Pinterest. So it's a, it's a very positive experience. I love Pinterest. I, ma- I make no excuses <laughs> for, for my behavior on Pinterest. I love it. I think it's a great place to categorize um, all the things that you want. I always say Pinterest is the person you want to be, right? It's a clothes you want to have. I should put a picture of Patrick on there. It's a cool factor. Yeah. I should put cool CEOs. But he's, uh, it's, uh, it's the clothes you want to wear. It's the garden you want to have and the meals you want to cook. And I think it's a great place uh, for a company like Overstock to really understand consumers. You know who does not do a good job of that, I think, is the Google. I think Google could do a much better job of uh, using all of the data they collect to um, to reach consumers. How, do, how important is it? At Overstock, and I know you know we've only got you a little bit longer, Patrick, because some 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 other people want your time. But um, how important is search, like being our Google um, play, into your strategy uh, for marketing at Overstock? Very, uh, very big. We were actually one of the first in the country, I think, doing paid search. Well, we were a little late to the game on natural search SEO, but as opposed to, we realized early if you've got you know, 10 Movado watches and you're you, the old, the old way to do it was get your message out to a million people and try to find the 10 who might be interested in buying the Movado watch today. Uh, if instead you focus on search, you're not trying to re- think how wasteful that is to reach that million people with your message. Instead, there are a hundred people going on the internet today or a thousand typing in Movado watch searching for it. So so if you have a good search program, you can find those people. Uh, just you, you can just be focusing on that, that hundred people and not trying to get your message to a million. Now to do that, you have to you still have to pay if it's paid search. That was we we got we had that insight very very early, uh, and we're aggressive about paid search. Natural search took us a little longer to get good at, but I think we we've, we've got good about six or seven years ago, and we're quite strong in it now. So you talk- and it's very important. Well, and you talked about Pinterest being a really strong platform, which absolutely makes sense. Um, do they share the analytics and data with you? I mean, how are you tracking the success of your use of that platform? Well, I know we have. I don't know uh, what they're sharing. I know that we have a a robust marketing analytics team that is engaged with our social media team. So we we track everything that can be tracked. Uh, we're also finding that there are other say similar platforms like house do you know house i you're going to turn me on to another platform that's similar to pinterest that i I, i'm going to have another addiction no i am not familiar with house well anyway it's for it's i'm I'm not it's not spelled like how like h-o-u-s-e it's spelled uh well you can look it up but it's (laughs) uh it's something like pinterest only for home and i think that those are going to i'm sorry and gardens and gardens, yeah, sorry. And and I think that more of those platforms will emerge that are specific to a certain type of uh, of area, and those are very effective. Uh, I think there are some in apparel now, but I'm sure it sounds like John knows a lot more about this uh, than I. <laughs> along He's with a pinner. Else. Well, you know that I go into my wife's uh, studio, and she she designs gardens, and the, I see this aspiration wall that she has, and she basically has cut out pictures of what she aspires her life to be, and she did this years ago, and she basically pinned it up on the wall, and I think that a lot of people are visual, and pictures are very powerful, and so things like Instagram and Pinterest and Howls that you're talking about is, are are tools that people use to. Uh, to basically compile their aspirations and to share that with other people. I think that uh, the whole idea of this narrow casting and communicating with your customer needs to move beyond uh, understanding what devices they're coming from and really understanding who they are because people – will expose their graph, their social graph, their information, so that you can connect more effectively with them. You could use that for one-to-one relationships as we do with Nimble, but in a in a large environment, you could start using that data to automatically segment customers and start communicating to them based on their likes and their, uh, their location information. And so uh, I'll tell you a story about a marketing company that sells uh, clothing, and what they do is based on the location that the person logs in from, they'll show 
show them a different university uh, sweatshirt and things. So they're basically coming in from uh, downtown LA. They're going to get different things, like they get USC things, instead of them coming in from, uh, let's say, uh, Utah, where they might get a different school. So I think there's a lot of ways to start communicating one to one with customers, especially if you get access to their uh, graph information. Well, I think that's brilliant. I think I love what you guys are doing at Overstock. I'm super excited to have you actually out here at the Brick House, Patrick. I know that you've got to run off to another meeting, but I want to thank you for, for staying on as long as you have. Did we lose him? Yeah, he dropped. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I almost didn't get that out. All right. Well, uh, so Chris and John, you both made some excellent points there. Um, I, I, you know, I think um, when it comes to, you know, tracking customers and keeping track of that information, it's really important. Uh, John, you pioneered the space and I want to have you come on at some point and talk about what that experience was like uh, pioneering CRM. Where is it today though? I mean, I mentioned Google. Google does not, I think, do a, a fantastic job as they, I think that they are missing some opportunities. Who's doing a really good job of of besides Overstock, really understanding their customers and using uh, CRM and customer relationship management tools to connect to their customer. Well, you know, Tanya, I think we're all struggling with that still today. If you think about the modern company, I mean, let's take Hootsuite as an example. The way Hootsuite runs is they get 100,000 new trials a month on their website. They take those leads and they put them in Marketo where they lead nurture them until they're qualified. Essentially, they score at a certain level. And then they put those leads into their CRM, Salesforce, and then they basically tell their inside sales team to go get them. And they basically go and immediately go out to Google and look people up, uh, who that person is, and they log what they know, and then they go and engage in Gmail and, and, and Hootsuite, engage and talk to the customer, and then they go log what they did in the CRM, and then eventually that customer buys, and their, that name goes into the NetSuite system for billing processes, and they also go into Zendesk for uh, service, but each of those platforms are islands. So basically, if there is a trouble ticket, or if there is a credit hold, or, or whatever, if you go into the CRM, CRM, you still don't have access to that information and you don't have access to the emails or the social conversations that occur. So basically, I think that companies today are still struggling with silos, even if they're big, sophisticated companies. And most companies aren't big and sophisticated. There's 225 million global businesses out there today. Less than 1% use a CRM. Most people's CRM is their inbox or a spreadsheet. And I think that today, um, that a lot of companies are struggling really understanding their customers and communicating across multiple departments effectively so there's one voice from the company. Let's talk about this idea of the creep factor, especially Chris, since you and I were talking about this <laughs> idea that Facebook is seeking a patent to um, to basically let kids um, network legally and there's all kinds of breaches in information. Google's being challenged to take down content. I mean, there's a lot of controversy about the content that we put out there what businesses uh, know about us and how they promote it. And the idea of letting kids, I mean, John, you've got what, two children? I mean, how old are your kids? Three. three? I've got three kids, yeah. So they're 10, they're 15, and they're 17. And and Chris, what do you think about this? I mean, um, as a father yourself, I mean, how do you, th how do you think we should approach um, younger and younger users using uh, social platforms like Facebook? Well, first of all, they shouldn't be. I have twin eight-year-old boys right now. Uh, neither one are, is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any of that stuff today. We've uh, fought that battle and, and won so far. Um, but, you know, the platforms are realizing that kids are using these platforms, um, and, and they are younger. I mean, uh, Facebook, there was a study back in 2012 that there's about 7 million people um, under the age of 13 who do have a Facebook account out there. And so uh, one of the things that's really prevented the use of Facebook and social media platforms is actually on a federal law. Um, and Facebook has been petitioning um, the government to go ahead and allow access for under th under age 13 for about over a year, year and a half now. Um, so they just recently launched um, or came public about a patent that they did have or that they do have for letting kids use its network legally, really through parent permission. So, you know, it's not so much that we're going to have something that it's kind of creepy. I think what we're looking at is 
where can a company go ahead and build the right kind of digital walls and boundaries within its own content that it has? And we know Facebook has a lot of content out there um, that you probably don't want um, someone under the age of 13 to go ahead and view. And so they're figuring out how to go ahead and build those boundaries within their content model to go ahead and allow children under the age of 13 that would be appropriate for, of course, um, changes in law to happen, but also, of course, um, to make parents comfortable with having their own children on those platforms. Uh, I find it very interesting. You know, we all have, I have little cousins and nephews and nieces and stuff like that, that, you know, do try to um, friend me on Facebook that might be 13, 14, 15 years old. And um, I always decline them. I don't really <laughs> want them seeing any stuff that I'm sharing. It's not that I'm sharing what are you really posting this? <laughs> great stuff. It's just, I, I don't want a 13 year old, like, you know, figuring out, you know, what I find funny, hilarious, and, and maybe kind of a bit more adult than what they do. I don't, I don't really want to have that own filter on myself. So, um, you know, I think it's great that Facebook is figuring out what are those walls within its own content model. Of course, we've had a lot of issues with Facebook and those walls within their own content model and privacy settings and stuff like that. So we'll see how it goes. But the good news is, is that they are pursuing it um, through this patent exercise and and we'll see what becomes of it. It's just uh, become public and, and it's uh, I think it's going to be the next kind of breakthrough as they look at more audiences to go ahead and conquer because they're kind of losing some of the millennial audience from a lot of the data that we're seeing because they have alternative platforms like Instagram and, and, um, and Snapchat that we were talking about yeah. earlier. Uh, Patrick. So, you know, they are, they need to find more audience themselves. Well, and they're going to, you know, younger and younger users are going to continue. And they're, you like to your point, they're already using the internet. I think it's, um, as, uh, you know, people who are creating these, um, tools for them to access, we need to also put in, um, not, not just as parents or, or, you know, adults, uh, education, but we also need to look at the platforms themselves and how, um, how younger users actually can benefit, uh, from using the web and not make it a detriment to their, uh, to their future for sure. So I don't know what's on your radar. Um, John, what are you, what are you watching right now? What's really important to you? Well, I really think that uh, companies are recognizing that their brand is made up of their socially empowered team members, that basically today it's not enough for marketing to basically be sending out your message. I think that uh, many companies are recognizing that they need to empower not just uh, their salespeople to begin engaging customers, but really everybody across the entire team to be building their personal brand and growing their professional network in order to grow the company brand. And so I'm hearing more and more about companies want, uh, asking their team members to be involved with uh, share, participating in the customer journey by sharing content and engaging with customers via that content. And I, I think that a lot of people are still struggling with that. And, uh, and what's interesting is that Big companies like IBM are starting to do that with uh, along the areas of social business, and uh, and we actually are starting to uh, teach IBM about social selling and empower their team members to begin doing these things themselves. And if IBM can do it, I think that you know a lot of the small and medium sized businesses can do it too. And IBM has done some really creative stuff um, in in the digital space. We'll have to have you come back on and talk more about what that relationship looks like. They're actually coming up on the show um, in the future in the next couple of months. So we'll have you, we'll have you back. Uh, Chris, um, what's on your radar right now? You know, there's been a lot of talk uh, about um, paid and organic and what's happening with organic reach on a lot of the uh, social platforms where people have built, uh, brands have built a lot of audience and they're having to repay again to go ahead and reach that audience. So we have a big kind of schism going on of who's going to really own that kind of uh, platform, uh, whether it's a marketing or communications or co even customer service or, or whatever it might be. And, you know, this is a, this is a big struggle um, on the whole idea of kind of content broadcasting, getting the message out through the social channels and um, as it becomes more and more paid, uh, we're starting to lose some of that one-to-one -one stuff that we've been talking about a lot on the show today. So I'm curious to see if we're going to see more of a, a comeback of what does one-to-one -one engagement mean instead of just simply the whole idea of how much I broadcast and shout my message out there into social channels and how many people it reaches. Uh, because that's been dominating the conversation for probably about two years now. And uh, hopefully we're going to come back to talk more about a lot of the relationship stuff we've been talking about on the show throughout today um, as the social channels and social teams really figure out what is social media really about? Is it about reaching the, the masses in, with one simple message or one structured tweet or Facebook post, or is it really about connecting with customers very directly? 
I think you know, Chris, I, I, I really believe that the more digital we get, the more human we need to be and that ultimately we're going to figure out it's not B to B or B to C. It's it's P to P and H to H, people to people and human to human. And uh, and I think that uh, broadcasting a, a unified message across uh, to customers is going to be recognized. It's not authentic and relevant and that we actually have to begin having conversations with customers uh, in, uh, in, in inspiring and educating them. And I think that this would be a great conversation, uh, to expand on. I think it's been a great conversation and I thank both of you for giving me so much of your time. I can't wait to have you both back and maybe expand on this topic a little bit more. If somebody wants to connect with you, John, what's the best way they can do that? Well, best way to get a hold of me is on Twitter. Uh, you see my name right there. It's John, J-O-N underscore Ferrara, F-E-R-R-A-R-A. -R -R -A, and uh, I'd love you to reach out and start to uh, um, sh read some of the content that I share. I try to inspire and educate on a daily basis to help people grow. And I'd love them to go out and try our Nimble platform at nimble.com because I truly believe that uh, your professional net worth is equal to some of your personal brand plus your professional network. And that you should be nurturing and building that brand and that network on a daily basis. And Chris, if somebody wants to connect with you, how can they do that? Twitter's fabulous. I'm also on Pinterest, though, too, at Seabacus. So go ahead and find me there, too. I'm going to cyber stalk you on Pinterest, then. You should never have All told right. me that. I love Pinterest. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And that wraps up another episode of Marketing Mavericks. You can find me on Pinterest, of course, or find me on Twitter at, at Tanya Hall Radio. And if you have some suggestions or ideas for the show or just want to connect with me, you can email me at mavericks at twit.tv. And um, I'll see you on social media. Until next week, have a great day.